Welcome everyone, and thanks for coming to this fourth speaker. I think that we're in for a real treat. Megan Redshirt Shaw is going to be doing a presentation on native identity and activism. And we just want to start by saying thanks and goodies to all of the sponsors, including the University of Alaska Southeast Sitka Campus Title III grant, our main sponsor, and also thanks to the Sitka Tribe of Alaska Social Services, Search, the Steps Grant, the Sitka Health Summit, and Pathways Coalitions. And thanks to all of you for tuning in to our uh, one-hour presentation with a very special guest who's calling in from South Dakota. So, as with all of our presentations, we'll start with the land acknowledgement. This is the one that was used at Indigenous Peoples Day last year. And this is open sourced. It's been vetted and so you can cut and paste it and use it at your next, uh, opening your next event when you're on in, in Klingit country. So here to do that is somebody who's in the decolonization discussion group as well. Mandy, would you please do the, um, do the land acknowledgement and Matt could put it in the chat. Yes, uh, so welcome everyone. We would like to start by recognizing that we are on Tlingit Ani. Ani is the Tlingit word for land. The Tlingit people have been in this place for over 10,000 years. It's important to recognize this historical fact and appreciate that the Tlingit people have been excellent stewards and have lived out the traditional tribal values around balance, respect, and caring for the earth that sustains us all. So for taking wonderful, wonderful care of this special place for time and memorial, we'd like to say thank you. Great, thanks so much for that. So, so next up, I'm gonna introduce my uh, fellow Search Health educator. She's also in the same speakers bureau as Megan is, and we found in the some talk before this, there was some connections. So here to introduce our keynote is uh, Sika's own Lakota Harden. Lakota. Uh, good in evening, everybody. I just I always sc scan through and see all your names and see who's all joining us. And uh, some of you have been to all the, the um, series, so thank you for coming. Uh, we want to acknowledge our ancestors always um, that are with us as well. I am very honored at this point to be able to have a, a Lakota sister here, um, here <laughs> in this in the Zoom room because. Uh, Many of you know I'm actually I'm from South Dakota as well and as we were talking we found out that I know her mother and I know her uncle and so I'm pleased to say that Megan although her accolades in her bio are all about education and higher education and supporting and assisting our young people to get their education and helping them once they get there to make sure that Native children have and Native young people have the opportunities. Uh, that's that's the, um, the road that she has taken and the path that she has taken to help get more of our people into higher education. But beyond that, she also comes from a long line of freedom fighters, um, never dismayed about um, not believing anything that was put on us that the Oglala Nation themselves have always been about liberation and resisting. And so that's who Megan, Megan's family is, and that's her work right now. And so she's very appropriate for us to, you know, we're trying to figure those things out, how to make social change, how to make change happen. And Megan's family, her uncle went to the UN at the very first non-governmental uh, indigenous rep representation back in 1977. So I'm very honored that she is with us. Um, I'm very thankful to you, Megan, for what you've done for our young people, especially, you know, the higher education. That's that's a very difficult road, and you've stayed on it. Your mother also is at. at you were at Harvard, and she is at Stanford. I think that's pretty amazing, <laughs> covering both ends of Turtle Island. Uh, so welcome to Sitka, and we appreciate you here and all the work that you've done for our young people. Welcome, Megan Redshirt Shaw. Thank you, Lakota. Um, I, uh, I think that one of the really special um, experiences for us is, is to find um, relations everywhere we go. And so it's really um, special for me to have you here in this call with us. And um, I'm already going to cry <laughs> one minute into, into sharing with you guys. So thank you, Lakota. Thank you for, um, thank you for calling um, my family and our nation in. It's really important. Um, 
I just want to say Pilame to, to everyone for joining tonight. Um, I was really moved to um, see the light outside in the background for everybody. Um, it's dark where I am currently. And so um, just to be able to, to see um, that you guys still have the sun and the sun is still greeting you. Um, that's a beautiful thing. And, and um, I have to say too, that this was a really, really special invitation. Um, I know that we're existing and operating in a, in a virtual world and in a virtual space, but um, when I received the invitation and it was um, everything that you could ever want to know or, or, or um, you know, think about Sitka, I just was really excited and moved. And um, I hope that someday I can join um, my relations there and visit and um, be in conversation and community with the indigenous communities there and allies that are there too. So um, I just want to say from, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for um, trusting in me this evening <laughs> to talk to you. I was sharing with the committee earlier that I want to be in conversation with you. I hope that um, we can collaborate as a collective and um, that your discussion group sounds incredible. Um, I don't know if you ever take mainland people <laughs> into your discussion group, but um, it just sounds like an incredible space that uh, you guys have created. So I just want to say again, um, Pilame, I'll introduce myself um, very briefly in Lakota and just share a little bit about myself and then I'll, I'll launch into the presentation that I've prepared today. Um, and just to say again that I hope that we can be in conversation with each other if it's not in this hour moving forward. Um, you know, I feel that any time that we share space, um, we become a part of each other's journey. And so I hope that um, in the future we're able to connect um, in other spaces and places in our lives. So, Michaje ki Megan Redshirt Shaw, the call Michaje ki Chanko Washsenwi, was the Hanaha Himataha and Walakota. I just said my name is Megan Redshirt Shaw. Um, I introduced my Lakota name, and um, I'm an enrolled member of the Ogallala Sioux Tribe, located on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Um, my mom grew up in Porcupine District, which Lakota is very familiar with, has a home. And um, I am a Lakota person, a Lakota wea, a Lakota woman. And um, I feel very blessed um, in my life. My parents were both in higher education. I moved around a lot to a different, a lot of different university campuses, um, but I chose to come home and I now live in the Black Hills. And, um, you know, I think that that was a really powerful part of, of my, um, my life was to come back to South Dakota and um, assert, especially for the students that I work with, that uh, these are our homelands, these are our, our knowledge systems and our, our ways of knowing are here. And so um, tonight I'm just hoping to share a little bit with you about the things that I've been thinking about. I know that um, many of you are focused on sort of thinking about justice and equity for your communities. And, um, you know, I like to think of any, any of these opportunities to just share thoughts as, as a way for me to also um, think through the things that I'm experiencing too. So I hope that, um, Again, we, we can come together in community and, and be in conversation. So I'll go ahead and share, share my screen. And this photograph, it was um, Lakota and I were just having um, moments that actually were really calming to me, but she recognized my uncle as the gentleman that's on the left with his fist raised. Um, and, um, you know, I always sort of keep him as a, as a reminder of, um, where we come from, the people that the people that create these spaces for us before and make it a little bit easier for us on the other side. So, you know, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit throughout the evening. Um, I came up with this this sort of title for for a talk at a time in my life when I was sort of grappling with um, what it mean, meant to be an indigenous person focused on. Um, identity and focused on activism and youth. And um, I took this photograph probably five or six years ago at the Stanford powwow. And um, I think one of the things that was always really, really important in my life um, was the possibility for the next generation of young people. And I think that that is so intrinsic to who we are as indigenous um, communities. We think um, seven generations ahead and we think seven generations behind us and um, calling in relatives to spaces and 
thinking about how we create a better world. Um, it's not just about us as, as individuals. It's a very Western way of thinking. Um, it's about us as community and how we make our nation strong. And, um, you know, I really grew up in a household where um, youth was celebrated and uh, the possibility of your future ahead, whether it was higher education or a career or um, anything that you felt like was, was the right fit for you was uh, something that you could dream. And so um, I'm still grappling with this title, uh, but I hope that I can work through that with you guys this evening as, as we sort of think, think forward and um, think about all of the things that you're experiencing too in your communities. So I just, um, you know, again, really wanted to say thank you. I hope that I acknowledged everybody quickly. Um, uh, Pila Maya and Narwopila, thank you so much. Um, I thanked you twice. Um, thank you and thank you, I said to you, uh, for inviting me. Um, uh, University of Alaska Southeast, Sitka Campus, the Sitka Tribe of Alaska, SAFB, Sitka Health Summit Coalition, the STEPS Grant, um, anybody else that I may have not acknowledged. Um, and then it's also really important for me to acknowledge my family. Um, my parents have been um, tremendous guides in my life and my partner, John, um, who is um, from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Um, and then the land too. This is a photograph that I took in um, our backyard. Uh, we have neighbors who bring horses during the spring and the summer and um, they're relatives. So I always call them my neighbors. <laughs> we don't have any other neighbors. It's actually just the horses. Um, and uh, I always greet them and I, I tell them hello. Um, we believed as Lakota people that um, the four-leggeds and the two-leggeds were uh, in community with each other, were each other's relatives. And I do believe in so many ways um, that we've lost, we've lost that appreciation as a society. Um, and I know that um, in, in your cultural practices for the indigenous people that are in, in the room, um, we have to reclaim those things, right, and say hello to our relatives. And I know you guys live in a beautiful place. I see all of your, your photograph backgrounds. Um, I'm jealous you are uh, celebrating um, Ni water. And um, I'm here um, with Makha land. And um, I just wanted to sprinkle my talk tonight with scenes of my backyard <laughs> so that you feel calm and I feel calm. And um, yeah, we can move forward in a good way. So thank you. Thank you so much for giving me the space tonight. I really appreciate it. You know, I wanted to, um, this was sent to me and um, it was presented beautifully earlier, but I, I just wanted to take a moment to um, acknowledge the land that, that you occupy. And I, I thought that this was a, a stunningly beautiful acknowledgement. Um, and I um, just say thank you. Thank you for allowing my voice to um, occupy homelands that are not mine. I, I fully acknowledge that and take responsibility for that. And I think that anywhere that we go, um, whether it's to um, Klingit territory or um, our, our homelands, that we should always acknowledge um, the spiritual, cultural, and traditional practices of, of other communities. And so um, I know that this was already iterated, but um, this is actually part of my research is, is thinking about land acknowledgements and land tied to, tied to education and higher education specifically. So um, I hope that, um, again, I can just reiterate and say thank you. Thank you to the Indigenous people, especially who are on this call and your relatives for um, allowing me to share this space with you tonight. So um, I also wanted to give space to people if, um, you know, there's any other homelands that are that are being represented on this call um, I would love for you to share them in the chat so that we can also acknowledge those indigenous communities um, I'm currently seated on my traditional homelands which just feels really good to say um, I like to tease my partner a lot because he's Dakota and they're uh, they're more eastern they're in Minnesota so uh, and Standing Rock I mean up north he's from Standing Rock um, but it feels good I like to tease him a lot and say you're on Lakota homelands <laughs> um, watch out um, and so if there's anybody else that's that's joining us from different places uh, you know once once this is uh, over and I can see the chat again I would love to I would love to see um, where you guys are, are coming in from or calling from as well. I, I think it's really important as we move forward this evening and think about racial equity and justice 
Um, and I say this, again, being an outsider in your community and not knowing the day-to-day -day struggles that different communities um, that you may represent or occupy or, or are allies with. Um, I don't know the specific struggles that they face, um, but it's really important for me, um, especially in, um, in our freedom or, or seeking of freedom as indigenous people to acknowledge that without black liberation, um, indigenous uh, sovereignty and honoring of sovereignty can't exist. And um, George Floyd and um, Black Lives Matter are um, a movement that are um, deeply, deeply important to be allies and to be a part of as, as indigenous, as BIPOC people. Um, it was a, an interesting spring and a very reflective spring. Um, I just moved from Minneapolis. I know the neighborhood where the uprisings were happening very, very intimately. And so I think that um, it's really important for us to take a moment and acknowledge as a community um, the loss of black life by police brutality and what has happened in this country um, to the black community. And um, you know, I think that again, in all of our struggles, we have to uplift each other and we have to support one another and we have to be in solidarity with one another. So um, I didn't feel comfortable in moving forward with, with sharing with you without um, sharing my sentiments um, and saying that Black Lives Matter. And I hope that as we move forward towards um, a world that believes in justice and equity, that um, we can all come together and continue to support one another. You know, something that I have been reflecting about a lot lately, and I, I work with young people. Um, I work for a program that is helping transition um, Native youth into programs of higher education. And um, I think one of the hardest challenges that we run into in especially convincing first year students who are undergraduates and going to college um, is that they're grieving the loss of um, not just people, relatives, relations, but also experiences. And so, you know, this evening on, on our call, I, I really hope that you as, as individuals or as community are able to take time for yourself to acknowledge that what we're experiencing currently as, as a world, um, as a planet is, is grief. And um, one of the most powerful things that I think I learned um, just as a, as a Lakota person is the idea of, um, of giving yourself time to mourn and to be sad. And, um, you know, I, I think that as we move forward in healing and hope for collective healing of, of our world, of our universe, um, that we give ourselves time to grieve. And it could be through COVID-19, it could be through the loss of experience, or milestones, especially for young people, the students that I work with, they didn't have their high school graduations or they're not moving into an athletic season or they have to stay home perhaps in an environment that isn't conducive to their learning um, or they don't feel supported in their home environment. They felt more supported at school, right? Those loss of experiences that they've had. Um, and then general raci racial injustices, which we are all in tune with, we, um, we have to acknowledge them, we have to grieve for the loss that we've experienced. And then um, political perspectives as well, whether you lean one side or another, um, if you believe in politics, if you're trying to decolonize yourself from, uh, from bipartisan or um, you know, tribal governments or community governments, um, the reality is that we're grieving. And I, I think that in any, any space where we're starting to talk about this, this rise towards equity, we have to acknowledge that. For a lot of our communities, we've been grieving for a long time. Um, COVID is not the first time that we've had to experience intense grief. And um, Native people, I think, are uh, Indigenous people especially, I think that um, we have tremendous ways of, of coping um, and uh, have been tremendously resilient in, in our lives as well. And so um, I just want to take that space and, and say that if you are in grief, um, I hold you. I hold you in my chante. I hold you in my heart. Um, and I, I hope that you're able to find solace in that. Um, and to say that as we move forward, um, we have to acknowledge that about ourselves.
I want to be really respectful of language. And so um, I just want to acknowledge that I thought that the title of all of this was stunningly beautiful. And I hope that as we gather in conversation afterwards, perhaps somebody um, might be willing to, to share this with me. Um, but this idea of for healing our spirit together. Um, we have to do this. We have to take the time to heal. And I, I just thought that this was a really beautiful, and language is power. Um, the land understands our language, um, you know, higher, higher powers, higher beings understand our language. So to be able to speak this concept as truth to power, I just think is a beautiful thing. Um, I also understand and acknowledge that we will never have perfect English translations for the things that, um, the things that our indigenous communities know. I think one of the most heartbreaking things that, um, that I ever heard from a family member was, um, who um, you know, is, is fluent in the language saying, I don't know how to perfectly translate that to you because there's no concept in English that perfectly translates this. And so I know that this isn't, this isn't a perfect translation of this concept, but I hope um, that this idea of healing our spirit um, can encompass something for you or, or speak truth to power for you as well. Um, I'd love to hear from some of you in the chat. I realize that I can pull the chat up here on the side. Um, what heals your spirit? And um, whether you identify with having a spirit or not, um, if you want to share in the chat what heals your spirit, I would love to hear it from you. Um, these are some of the things that, that heal my spirit. Um, I uh, love learning my language very slowly. My mom is a fluent speaker. My Ina is a fluent speaker. Learning my culture, I'm learning all the time. Um, every day I get to learn and I, I hope that you feel joy in that too. Learning new things in general. I've taught myself how to knit recently. <laughs> Re-knit, I learned in fourth grade and I've, I've taught myself how to do it again, which I know in Alaska would be very helpful. Um, Connecting with students, I feel so empowered by that. Um, and then spending time with my partner and my family and the people that I love. Um, see, I love this. I love seeing what, what other people find joy in. And hopefully we, we can find that across each other too. Um, singing, time with friends, being with granddaughter, talking with trees, music, breathing, making people smile, poetry, ocean, reading family travel, joy being in and co-creating community. My cats, oh, I meant to put my cat on here. I love my cat. Um, uh, being on the ocean or in the forest, dancing, creating art. I mean, these are all beautiful things. And I think that sometimes in, in times of difficulty, we forget, um, or sometimes we allow ourselves to forget in, in the stress of, of things. And so um, with that title and um, with what you've shared, right, how do we, how do we heal our spirits moving forward? Um, and this is another photograph of, of the Black Hills. We actually got snow last week. Um, it was 85 degrees on Monday. And then on Tuesday, we had four inches of snow. So uh, this is from last year, but snow is healing too. So how do we heal ourselves? What makes us feel whole? So I mentioned to you earlier that I, I feel increasingly uncomfortable with the term activism. And I don't, I don't know why that is. I don't know if um, I feel uncomfortable with the term activist. I don't know if I feel like that's fully encompassing of what we do um, when we live our lives, when we find success in our lives. Um, but for me, I'm grappling with it. I'm trying to figure it out. Some of the things that I think are acts of revolution for indigenous people, I wanna talk about a little bit because I think that they really, um, they encompass um, how we move forward in, in caring for each other and, and caring for community and caring for the environment and caring for culture. So these four principles are actually um, the program that I currently work for. Um, these are four things that we talk to the students about. It's an environmental sustainability program um, for Native students and allies. And we ask them to really consider these four things. So I'm gonna move, I'm gonna move forward through them in the same way that I would move forward if I was working with students. Care of self. 
I think, I think especially for indigenous people, um, this can be very hard. Um, for those of you that, that identify, um, for those of you that are allies, I think for us, um, individualism is a very Western concept. And the idea of any focus or attention on, our, on ourselves um, being given platforms to speak um, when maybe we don't even feel like we've built half of our knowledge base yet um, in gratitude. Um, you know, I think that this can be really uh, difficult for us to, to grapple with is who are we and, and what makes us feel whole and how do we care for ourselves. And I see it all the time in our students. Um, they don't want to be the center of attention. They don't want to be focused on. Um, and the idea of sort of this uh, individualistic rise to the top through the ranks of higher education is so, so hard for them. Um, but I tell them so often that um, sometimes the greatest joy that your community sees, sees in you is the success that you find for yourself, whether it's Western or not, um, whether we've evolved maybe into something different. Um, than what we used to be with just sort of this pure sense of community and pure sense of responsibility to community. So I, you know, a lot of times we'll ask students, who are you? What gives you joy? What strength, strengthens the things about yourself that you love? And how do we move into Western ideas of individualism, I meant to say comfortably? How do we do that as Indigenous people? And I apologize that I left comfortably out. But this is the first pillar. This is the first pillar in the program that we work with with our students. And so I think that this is, I again think this is intrinsic to doing work focused in justice, is care of self. Who are we? What makes us excited? What are we passionate about? I get asked a lot um, in education especially, um, how do you set boundaries for yourself? And one of the things that my partner and I often say is that working with Native youth, working with Native community, working with Native students going into higher education, it's not a nine to five job. It's not. You become their auntie, you become their uncle, you become like family to them. So care of self is deeply, deeply important when we're doing this work. Um, sometimes setting boundaries, sleep, water. <laughs> the basic parts of life that we forget about so often, um, spending time with people that we love. So this is really the first thing that I say to students is how do you, how do you care for yourself? And self-care, I feel like, is a term that gets tossed around. Um, sometimes I think it sounds corny, which is ridiculous. It's just a reordering of words, but care of self. How do you make yourself feel whole? Deeply important. The second pillar, and again, this is this, the shape of this idea is in a circle, right? So all of these things inform each other. But the next that I talk about often is care of community. Who is your community? And for everybody on this call, that means a different thing. It could be your family, it could be your extended family. What support systems are they creating to make the collective better? Community is defined by the people who are a part of it. Whether it's a healthy one or not, I'll let all of you think about that and decide. Um, whether it's one where you feel like people are uplifted, I hope you do, especially in justice work. But I say this to students because I think for especially Native students, we work with majority Native students, um, colonization has done a number on us in a lot of our communities. And so students have to grapple with who their community is. Maybe they grew up in the heart of it. They know their culture, they know their language, they understand their identity. They're able to map out exactly who their relatives are. Um, but we work with other students who colonization has impacted their family lines and they may not be as connected to community and they may have lost language and they may have lost cultural identity. And I'm sure you see this too. Um, so the first really important thing for them to define is who, who is that? It's your tribal nation. Maybe it's not, maybe it's your city. Maybe it's Sitka. Maybe it's your school or university. Um, and what are they doing to uplift everybody? Is that a community that you want to be a part of? Because you have agency to choose. And then what role do they play, right? After really thinking about themselves as individuals, what role do they play in that community? And how does it help with care of self? Uh, how does it sometimes become a detriment to that? For them, 
they're redefining their community a lot of times when they come into higher education. They have to learn a whole new community. They have to learn the language of that community. Um, we work with a lot of first generation students. What are office hours? What does that mean? I always laugh about that because in school, in high school, a lot of times for our students, office hours, that means that they're in trouble. They're going to the teacher's office or they're going to the principal's office. But in their new higher education community, that means that they're asking for help and they're practicing self-care or they're building community by meeting with their professor. So making sure that when they're moving into this idea, right, they're thinking about terms. What do those terms mean? It's really deeply important. How many times can we acknowledge the land? Um, we don't give thanks enough as a nation, as a world. And so saying to students, um, environment or land, what defines your environment? Is it your ancestral homelands? Are you occupying somebody else's? Is it your work or your employment space that you're thinking about this, right? What is your environment? What is the environment that you're part of? One of the things that I don't think we ask of the land or the ocean or the rivers or the streams or the trees, someone said talking with trees, um, what brings the land joy? So the land is living. And the building that you're sitting on, whether it's your home or um, somebody else's home or uh, a building, a public building that you're in, um, it sits on living land. It's breathing underneath us. So what brings that land joy? Is it um, walking around outside and identifying the different types of sage that is native to here and was native to our people and gave us strength? Or is it picking raspberries off the trail that I live by, right? What brings, what brings the land joy? And what support systems as, as individuals and as community are we creating to make the environment better? The bottom line is that for all communities and in equity work and injustice work, if the land is strong, we're strong. That is intrinsic to who we are as Native people, as Indigenous people. If the land is strong, we're strong. I had a student who once said to me that um, her grandfather used to say, um, be as strong as the land that made you. And I've remembered that for a long time. And maybe it's a quote from a book, but I always attribute it to this uh, young Diné woman's grandfather. Don't tell me if it's from a book. I don't want to know. I believe that it was his quote. Um, but just this idea that, that the land is a part of who we are. Right. It's a relative and we have to we have to care for it in order to, to move forward for a more just world. And finally, in the circle, care of your culture. And with this, I'm really, you know, sort of connecting and speaking to um, to other indigenous people that are here, but everybody, you know, everybody identifies with culture differently. So for our students, what defines it? Is it native identity or is it other identities? Is it identifying as LGBTQIA? What brings it joy? Learning and reconnecting to community. I just say to students all the time that I hope that you're learning every day of your life. I hope that uh, you continue to challenge yourself to learn, whether it's a dance on TikTok or um, it's something from your family or it's about the land. Um, you know, I hope that you continue to learn and that you find joy in that. For many, uh, it's reconnecting to community. I came home, I came back to South Dakota, and uh, one of the most beautiful things I think here, having never never grown up here, but really feeling uh, a call to action to return, was um, friends that were here saying, welcome home. I think that that's one of the most powerful thing that you can say to um, to a native person who gets to, gets to come come back to the center of creation for us. And what support systems are you creating to make your culture stronger? So is it learning your language? Is it learning your medicines? Is it learning your art? Is it reconnecting to community again? So I wanted to, I wanted to share those ideas, those concepts to you. As we think about this idea of we're still here, what kept us here? What has kept Native people working towards justice. It's all of these things. It's being informed by all of these things. 
and I hope that the next generations that they continue to to absorb and learn and um, decide that these things continue to be important to them. I said this recently to a group of students, what does the future hold for us? And I hope that it holds the continued survival and thriving indigenous people. I believe that that's the greatest form of revolution. Um, I think that uh, we are resilient, we are powerful, we're funny, we can laugh. I think that Native people, no offense, I think Native people are so funny. I think we're some of the funniest people. We've learned to laugh over time. Um, we've learned to use humor through all of the complicated things that happened to us um, through colonization, settler colonialism, loss of land, loss of access. Um, we've learned how to laugh. We've learned to find joy in one another. And I believe that that's what revolution is. So I hope that all of those things inform a little part of that, right? A part of how we've gotten here. Um, Cause I'm proud of us. I'm really, really proud of us. Uh, I think we're beautiful and thriving and that we'll continue to live forever. So one of the really important things I think uh, for me to just acknowledge about my own research um, is that I uh, am grappling with this idea of we're still here. In higher education, it becomes we're here. Um, I think unfortunately, a lot of times uh, I see this in so many Native student experiences. Um, colleges and universities just to forget that we're on campus. And um, I had that experience as an undergraduate. I was um, one of five Native students out of 20,000 students that were on campus, both undergraduate and graduate. And man, I just felt invisible. I felt so invisible. And I was coming from a family where my culture was really sort of grounded in, in who I was growing up and was normal. It was so normalized when I was growing up that when I went to higher ed, it almost was, it was culture shock. I think I've studied it because I, 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 need, to, I need to unpack and understand that experience for myself to heal. Um, so I'm currently a PhD student in higher education at the University of Minnesota. Um, I, again, am uh, trying to understand higher education. Working with Native students is just my greatest passion in the whole world. Um, I think that, I think they're, obviously they're the future and I, I hope that um, a little bit of my own healing can, can help them. Um, but they teach me so much. I, I learn more from them than they probably ever hear or learn from me. But some of the things that I'm grappling with in that research is Western versus Lakota knowledge. Um, higher education is a liberation space. And then the really important question, can higher education be a liberation space for BIPOC people? Wasn't created for us. So I don't know if that's true. I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, setting a system that wasn't created for me. Understanding a system that, no offense to all the higher education professionals in here, I love higher ed, um, but a, a lot of our systems don't make very much sense. Uh, uh, we're trying to figure that out, especially during COVID-19. Um, I'm really trying to focus my research on the state of South Dakota, especially in higher education policies here. Um, and it's a lot to unpack. It's a lot to think about and reflect on. When I think about the idea of we're still here, um, if you have not read this report, this report completely shifted the trajectory of my research and my interest in the last year. Um, it was published through High Country News um, by Robert Lee and Tristan Atone, and it is called Land Grab Universities. And it is about the impact that the first moral act has had on land grant institutions. Um, and the complicated history of expropriated indigenous land and what those institutions have profited off of. Um, I really, really encourage you to read this. This came out in March, totally blew my mind. Um, it was right on the cusp of all of the COVID-19 stuff um, starting to happen, starting to really unravel in the country. And then when this report came out, my entire research focus shifted. I was sort of going in this direction of um, native student experiences in higher ed, which I still think is deeply important. We need more research focused on that. And I started to sort of shift my attention towards, okay, what is, where is my place in this? In this idea of we're still here, we're still on college campuses, this land occupies our knowledge systems, and how do I, fig how do I grapple with this? How do I figure this out? So I want to acknowledge that this, this report by these gentlemen and their research team totally, totally rocked my world. Um, and I really encourage you to take a look at it if you haven't seen it yet. So from that report, um, I was asked to write a policy brief. And um, my background, uh, my, I guess, professional 
uh, professional background is in undergraduate admissions and college counseling. I started as an admissions officer. Um, I worked at a few different institutions and then I became a college counselor and now have sort of um, had the opportunity to kind of be in the middle of that transition period from high school into higher education. So that's really my passion is, um, you know, thinking about how students, especially Native students, are choosing institutions of higher education, the admissions process, financial aid. I am very, very interested in financial aid. So this idea of what is the what is the phrase we are still here translate into for me, um, I wrote a policy brief stemming from the land grab university report. And I started um, really thinking about challenging institutions to think about what is a land acknowledgement, what does a land acknowledgement mean for indigenous people without the land? And what is indigenous knowledge without the land? This was published in August um, and really my charges to higher education moving forward. Um, again, this idea of still here, what are you going to do for our students um, was either that institutions of higher education, one, return institutional land back to Native nations, back to their rightful stewards, um, their rightful owner owners, or two, if institutional land cannot be returned to Native nations, provide free higher education to Native students on their traditional homelands as land-based reparations. Um, I released it, I put this out into the world and um, I'm starting to sort of think about what the next iteration of this looks like. Um, this is and has become my great passion is understanding how we can actually make tangible change for Native students to have easier experiences in higher education. Um, and acknowledging the idea that loss of land means loss of knowledge for us. Um, we can't teach students about, about Native plants or medicines or food or ways of life without having that access. And especially for, student, for um, schools that benefited from the first Moral Act, um, I am moving into uh, doing my oral prelim work and uh, this is really what I want to focus on. This is where I feel like I fit in somewhere in, in the space in all of the amazing things that I know all of you are doing. Um, this is really where I feel like my we are still here, my activism lives. So these are my contentions with higher education. Um, American colleges, this is something that I wrote in that, American colleges and universities are morally obligated to acknowledge the educational needs of indigenous peoples and to face their ongoing system of power that perpetuates the repression and erasure of indigenous people and their knowledge systems. And um, I also contend with higher education that there are native students on your campus. Um, what access to land and ancestral knowledge have those students lost? What profits have our institutions made with that access? And what power do words hold for students without action? So when I'm sitting in a room and an administrator acknowledges the land, um, I'm seen for a moment and I feel it, but who am, who am I without access to knowledge? Knowledge is power, um, connection to who we are is power. So this is my little corner of the world uh, when I think about trying to push the narrative forward that, that we still exist and that we're still here. So before I, before I leave some time, I have set a timer. I've set a timer on my watch but before I pass along some time to be in conversation or to um, ask questions if you have them, uh, what do you think about in your own work when you hear the idea of we are still here as indigenous people, as allies within a settler colonial system, within a capitalist system, within a sexist system, ableist system, heteropatriarchal system, and what have we survived? Whether you identify as an indigenous person or not, what have you in your life survived? So when you think about those terms, we are still here, what does that mean to you? For me, it means the land. And for me, it means making higher education easier for our students through financial aid reparations. That's what I feel excited about. That's what I feel charged about. But for you, I ask for all of you in, in your own activism, in your own work and community, in your amazing decolonization discussion group that you have, which is so cool. Um, what do you think about when you hear those words? And how do we continue to survive and thrive amidst a very, very complex system? 
in a very, very complicated nation. How do we move forward? I charge all of you with that question. So I'll, these are my final sort of questions for you. Um, what work is pushing your community forward in justice and equity? What do you feel hopeful for? It can be extremely hard to feel hope. And again, acknowledging that grief, going back to that. How do we adapt and change with the current times? How do we keep that care of self, care of community, care of land, and care of culture at the center of who we are? And for Indigenous people, how do you assert that within your community? Native or not, how do you know that your voice is heard and your voice is valued? And how do we heal? How do we heal as a collective? Whether in Sitka or elsewhere, whether here in Hesapa in the Black Hills, where I feel rejuvenated by the opportunity to be close to the center of creation for my people. Um, how do we heal and how do we push forward? Those are the things that I hope that you're able to consider as you walk away this evening, walk into your amazing discussion group. So I just, I just want to say again, um, you know, I, I think that um, we have to continue to show gratitude towards each other and care and love. And even if we don't agree, um, to take moments to, to try to listen to each other, to try to be respectful of one another. Um, and I love being in conversation with, with, everyone, anyone. And so um, that's my contact information. That's my Gmail. That's my Twitter handle on the bottom. If you tweet or twit or whatever the verb is. Um, and I, again, just want to say, uh, which means thank you. And thanks so much. Um, I really appreciate you spending your evening with me and um, look forward to be in conversation or have any, have any questions put forward too. again. So thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. That was uh, great. We do have some time for questions. If people want to type in that ask a question in the chat box, take a minute to reflect on what uh, Megan shared with us. And I was going to start off with a question and then um, we'll have a few more come in. Um, so Megan, so this decolonization discussion group, how do you describe, I think the group's intention is to kind of go from a kind of an unhealthy colony mindset into a, a healthy community. But how do you describe decolonization as a, as a concept, especially if maybe it was somebody who's not familiar with that term or even word? Um, how, how would you describe that? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think um, for me, I'm I'm working through learning. I'm working through learning the language, and I think one of the things that um, I was sort of sharing earlier was this idea of um, you know English. Um, English will never be able to perfectly translate uh, concepts that we have in our culture or concepts that we have in our community. And I, I think that um, moving, towards, moving towards decolonization is maybe an undoing of what we believe has always been, uh, been the system, been the system that these things have occupied. Um, I think that we believe that especially higher education has to work a singular way or there's an, only a certain way that um, thoughts or ideas are, are presented. And um, I think that in order to decolonize in larger spaces as indigenous people, I think it has to do with language and, and culture and access to knowledge. But I think um, as allies or within other communities, it's this idea of maybe moving away from um, what we believe is the only way or believe is the only, um, uh, is the, only the way that things have been. And really returning to this idea that um, there's so much that the earth can teach us and there's so much that um, elders in our communities can teach us and um, that we have to be willing to, to open our minds and our hearts to that, um, even if it makes us feel uncomfortable. Um, you know, I, I think it's really uh, powerful to sort of think about um, the idea that this is a process that we work through for our, our, our entire lives. Um, Patrick Wolf very famously said, you know, um, settler colonialism is a, you know, it's a structure. It wasn't an event that happened. It wasn't a singular event that happened to our people. It's a structure that was put in place by, by the United States, by Canada, um, by many other governments. And it's, um, you know, it's been, it's been successful, um, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that it's the only way that we, that we move forward in, in solidarity with one another. So, um, 
I hope that answers your question. Um, but I think that it's just the idea that we have to, we have to listen to each other and listen to other knowledge systems um, and be open and grateful to, to receiving that knowledge too. Well, Megan, there are some higher ed people on the line. So I want to ask this question uh, kind of for them. If you could go back your experiences as a student and then going to where you're at now and then where you hope to be, what have you seen from when you're a student to now uh, in, in terms of, of these institutions and, um, and, and how it has uh, particularly been for indigenous students? And then where do you want to be yeah. for institutions? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that, um, I had a really, and I, I also want to, I also think it's really important as we do this work that we acknowledge our privileges too. I, I grew up in higher education. I had way more, um, structural understanding of how higher ed operated than a lot of the students that I work with now. And so I think it's really important for me to acknowledge that that was a privilege that I walked into college with. At the same time, um, you know, I think again, coming onto a campus where I was one of five native students, um, 20,000, it was just like, I felt like I was being swallowed whole by the system. And so I, I think now, especially um, in going through my master's and then going into my doctoral program, um, I just, I think the most important thing that I can pass on to students and the gift that I was given as an undergraduate was just listening. I feel like I had people that listened to me and really allowed me to express um, the things that were frustrating to unpack experiences I might have had in the in the classroom that were harmful or hurtful, and I think that in working with working with our students, um, you know, I just see that a lot of times they really really need someone to listen to them and to honor that their experiences are true, whether or not that may make the other person uncomfortable on the other side. Um, we just ha we have to um, honor honor their experiences as truths. And so for me in, in sort of work, moving into my work and trying to figure that out, um, I just encourage anybody that works in higher education, if you, if you have a native student or an indigenous student that trusts you, um, it's, hard, it's hard to see systems uh, that have really challenged your communities and then be asked to trust them. And education has done that for our communities. So um, if, if they don't open up to you automatically, I, I got to work on some for years before they even want to have any kind of conversation with me. I think back to my own experiences and I just really grateful to the people who listened and honored my experiences, even if they didn't always understand. Um, so I think that those are some of the things that I, that I hope that I can pass on to other, um, yeah, other people that are experiencing that with Native students too. Excellent. Thanks, Megan. We do have some questions coming in the chat. This next one says, in your opinion, does the function of an ally change when working with different marginalized groups? If so, how? If not, why not? You know, I think, and I think that, again, this is, this is, it's really important for me to acknowledge my experiences as a, as a Lakota person. Um, you know, I hope, I hope that allyship is rooted in listening to I really do. And I, I really hope that allyship is rooted in, in diversifying the voices that you listen to. Um, I can only speak to my experiences as Megan in the world that I operated in. Um, but it's, I think that as we move forward, um, diversifying your uh, community list, diversifying the books that you read, um, the people that you're following on social media, the movies that you watch, um, the videos that you spend time with, um, the community that you choose to call your own. Um, I don't want to speak to other experiences because I don't think that it's appropriate for me to. I, I hope that, I, I think that the, the best answer for me to provide is that I really hope that um, that as an ally in any community, in any group, and I, I try to do this in, in you know, every conversation that I have when I'm, when I'm listening and learning and honoring experience, um, is to just set, you know, set your own ego aside and, and listen um, and understand that the knowledge that somebody is sharing with you, um, you know, it should be respected no matter, no matter what, you know, if their experience makes you uncomfortable. So, um, you know, I don't think the function changes, but I do think the way that you approach conversation and, um, and, you know, think about reaching across the aisle, no matter who you are, it, it has to be with, um, with respect and understanding and having an open heart and an open mind. Excellent. Thank you. So many good notes from this presentation, Megan. I appreciate, 
uh, what you're sharing with us. The next question says, how do you balance theory and practice? Um, you know, I think, and um, my partner and I say this a lot, he, he, we work together and work with Native students. And I actually, you know, there's nothing that I have learned in the classroom that I feel is more important than being on the ground with students. Um, I've had professors share, you know, share their theories with me about working with a certain set of students and all of, all of these different things that I think, again, in theory can be really powerful, can be really interesting in research. Um, but there is nothing that teaches you more than being in a classroom. Nothing. And I, every, every student that I have worked with has taught, taught me or informed me or totally schooled me, totally broken down all of the things that I thought were correct. And I know that I'll learn that for the rest of, I'll keep learning for the rest of my life. Um, for me, you know, again, I think that, um, I think that the, the best pieces of theory that I have learned, um, I took an American Indian Studies minor in my doctoral program, which Minnesota gives us an opportunity to have minors in our graduate work, which I always think is really interesting and very different. Um, but I do have an American Indian Studies minor. And so being able to actually um, learn theory and put words to, um, to the structures, to the events that have happened, that have impacted Indian education, that's been the most powerful thing to me because I'm able to turn around and say to my students, um, I can't teach you about your experience, but I can give you the historical frameworks that have informed why you're having these experiences in higher education. Um, these systems were not created for us. They were not created with us in mind, even when they said that they were. Um, Harvard's charter has native students written into it, um, but we were a fundraising tool for Harvard. Um, so, you know, being able to actually understand uh, the history of how we got to where we are right now, I feel like that theory was, was the best framework for me to understand. But in terms of practice with students, uh, every day is a new interesting <laughs> challenge. And, uh, you know, I just try, again, I keep saying listening over and over and over again, but I just try to listen. I think that's the most important thing in my balance. Great, and the, the last question, and we just have a few minutes left, um, but wanted to get to this last one. It says, for allies, how do you balance the need to see change versus the need to feel good? Oh, that's a good one. That's a big question uh, with two minutes left. <laughs> how much time? I, I have two minutes to answer this. Um, okay, uh, that's a really good question. You know, I think that, um, I, I think that one of the most, uh, one of the most harmful and strange things that I think that Native people sort of experience is guilt. I think that we, we have this, there are a lot of allies that feel a tremendous amount of guilt, like for what, what has happened. Um, and, and we understand that we carry that own internalized guilt with us as well. Um, but I, I think that really sincerely as allies in any community, because I'm, a, you know, I'm acting and operating as an ally across communities that I don't identify with as well, really asking yourself the question, am I, am I doing this work? Am I challenging myself to grow or am I doing this work because I feel like it's the right thing to do? And what biases do you unpack about yourself in that work? Like, what are the internalized biases that you are coming into the work holding on to? Um, and you know, what is it that what is it that really truly pushes you forward to to make the world a more just and equitable place? I think it's really really important for you to unpack that about yourself, your privileges, the privileges that you don't even realize that you occupy, um, and really genuinely challenge yourself to um, to be doing the work for the right reasons. Um, but man, I wish I had another hour to unpack that with you. I'm unpacking that every day of my life. So um, if, you get, if you get a good two minute answer in the future, definitely let me know. Um, but again, I just, I just wanna say um, thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity to be with you this evening. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much to Megan on behalf of everybody. Uh, it was wonderful. We're gonna take a two minute break, but- no, I just you'll have wanna a say that too. I wanna just say that Megan, all of us here, there's a lot of us, and I know our community, we're um, a small but mighty crew in our town really trying to make a change. And we're so honored to have you. And I, this Zoom thing is so impersonal, but we all, you can see in the chat, everybody's saying thank you. Gunus Chish, which is the way the Tlingit people say thank you. But thank you so much. And I think you really gave, spoke from the heart, um, made me proud 
you know, made all our ancestors proud and all the work that's gone before us. Thank you for continuing that and for being with us. And yes, we will bring you at some point so you can meet everybody. <laughs> but thank you. Pilamia. Pilame, Lakota, thank you. I want to go to Sitka so bad. If someone wants to sponsor, <laughs> I will get on a boat. Like, I'm ready to, I'm ready. So <laughs> thank you again. I really appreciate it. Well, you have a lot of fans here now, Megan. So thank, thanks so much, everybody. We're just going to put the, uh, leave the chat up so you have a chance to, to say a thank you message to Megan, read other peoples. We'll be back in two minutes, and then we'll go into our dyads and have some discussion about what Megan shared. So thanks, Megan. Thanks, everybody. If you want to stay, we'll see you in two. Thank you.